Americans didn't invent free market capitalism, but you might say they perfected it. In doing so, they created more wealth for more people than any society in the history of the world. To begin to understand this fascinating and complex story, we have to travel back in time to the very first settlers of America. But before we get to the history, let me define what I mean by capitalism. It's not an easy term to pin down because it developed over thousands of years of human interaction. Adam Smith, the great English thinker, first described it in his famous 1776 treatise, The Wealth of Nations, but he didn't invent it. For our purposes here, I define capitalism as an economic system in which individuals freely decide what they will produce and who they will serve. Since both parties have to consent, it's a system in which success demands that you serve the needs of others before you are rewarded for your work. Now back to history. When the first settlers arrived at Jamestown in 1607, then Plymouth in 1620, they were operating under an economic system common to all European nations at that time known as mercantilism. Under mercantilism, businesses, especially in the colonies, were operated for the benefit of the state. While governments permitted the companies to make profits, their primary purpose was to advance the national interest of England or Spain or France. The early American settlements were set up to be self-sufficient so that the English government didn't have to support them and they had to stake out territory. That was key to the colonial game. If England held the territory, Spain and France didn't. The early colonists began their adventure with what they thought was a beautiful idea. They set up a common storehouse of grain from which people were supposed to take what they needed and put back what they could. Lands were also held in common and were worked in common. The settlers owned no land of their own. Though there was no name for this system, it was an ideal socialist commune. And you can probably guess what happened. It began to fall apart almost immediately. As the colonists learned, when everyone is entitled to everything, no one's responsible for anything. A colonist who started his workday early or stayed late received the same provision of food as a colonist who showed up late, went home early, or didn't work at all. After about two years, the settlement was reduced to eating shoelaces and rats. Half of them died of starvation. Captain John Smith of Pocahontas fame took control of the colony and scrapped a socialist model. Each colonist received his own parcel of land. Private property had come to the new world. He who won't work won't eat, Smith told them, citing the biblical admonition. Well, they worked and they ate and the colony was saved. The same story unfolded further north in the Plymouth colony 10 years later. Although this was a Puritan colony with religious goals, its plan was the same as Jamestown's, and it also failed. As its young governor, William Bradford, noted, by adopting the communal system, we thought we were wiser than God. So they quickly abandoned the commune for private ownership. Soon they had an abundance which they celebrated with a holiday we now know as Thanksgiving. Over the next 150 years, this hard-learned lesson that men should be responsible for their own economic fate became conventional wisdom in the colonies. The American Revolution was largely fought over the burden that British mercantilism placed on the colonies. Two unpopular taxes, the Stamp Act and the Tea Act, are well-known examples. The Americans saw the British government regulating and controlling almost all of their economic activities and didn't like it. Now, it's true that even after gaining independence, none of the founders could be called capitalists. The idea of capitalism as a description of an economic system was only just beginning to be discussed in America. Yet many of the most influential founders intuitively gravitated toward free market principles. Thomas Jefferson's ideas of private land ownership shaped the famous land ordinance of 1785 that made public land available to private citizens. While Alexander Hamilton's concepts of individual responsibility and sanctity of contracts could be seen in the Panic of 1791-92, in which he steadfastly refused to allow the U.S. government to bail out bankers who had triggered the panic. Benjamin Franklin, of course, had practiced capitalism all his life with his printing business and with his maxims in Poor Richard's Almanac. The Constitution itself is awash 
in core concepts of a free market, sanctity of contracts, freedom of expression, powerful limits on the government's ability to regulate or tax, an emphasis on paying debts, and so on. In short, it was the wisdom of experience, not academic ideology, that created America's free market principles. The result has been the most prosperous and free nation in the history of the world. I'm Larry Swikart of the University of Dayton for Prager University. Take a close look at this. Jonathan Haidt, the noted New York University psychologist, calls it the most important graph in the world. Why does he say that? Because he knows this graph reveals a simple, inescapable fact. There is no substitute for free market capitalism as a promoter of human prosperity. Let it be noted that Haidt is no one's idea of a conservative. But when hard evidence stares him in the face, he's not going to look away. The graph is based on the research conducted by the late British economist Angus Madison. The numbers along the x-axis are years, 2,000 of them. The number on the y-axis are dollars, all of them, divided by the number of people on the planet. It's what's called GDP per capita, which is the world's economic output divided by its population. GDP is considered the best measurement of a country's standard of living, and in this case, the world's standard of living. Often when I show this graph to students, I get this comment, that's not capitalism, it's just the impact of the Industrial Revolution. So I show them another chart by the Madison Project. This one breaks the GDP hockey stick into regions. As you can see, there are a number of hockey sticks, but note that they don't rise at the same time. The United States surged first. Why? Well, in a very fortuitous coincidence, the year 1776 witnessed both the signing of our Declaration of Independence and the publication of a book called The Wealth of Nations by the Scottish economist and philosopher Adam Smith. In his book, Smith explained how to create a modern free market capitalist economy and the benefits of doing so. America's wise founders took Smith's principles to heart, and within a mere 100 years, the blink of an eye historically, capitalism turned the United States from 13 backwoods colonies into the world's largest economy, and it's held that position ever since. Western Europe shot up as well, but later. It rose steadily during the Industrial Revolution and then experienced a sharp rise after World War II when, between the end of the war and the mid-1960s, it fully embraced the free market. Japan, too, shot up after World War II, surpassing Western Europe for the first time, after the U.S. helped the Japanese transition to a democracy and a free market capitalist economy. Eastern Europe took off after it was released from the Soviet Union and socialism in 1991. China did likewise after the Chinese moved away from strict socialism and implemented some limited free market policies. One can only imagine where China would be now if its leaders had fully unleashed the forces of the free market. Yes, during this period of economic expansion, the wealthy got wealthier. That always happens when new wealth is created. But the middle class and the poor also greatly benefited. Here's another telling chart. This one is from the World Bank. In 1820, 94% of people lived in extreme poverty. Thanks to capitalism, by 2015, that number declined to 9.6%, single digits for the first time in human history. Now, it's still too many, but if we're going to reduce the number even more, we need to understand what caused the decline. Free market capitalism. If we combine the Angus Madison hockey stick chart and the World Bank data on extreme poverty, what we get is something quite amazing unprecedented global prosperity and an unprecedented decline in poverty across the globe over the past 200 years. That's capitalism in a nutshell. One more chart. Johan Norberg, a Swedish economic historian, shows us how well ordinary people do when they work in a free market economy. Since 1990, hunger, poverty, illiteracy, and child mortality have all declined significantly with the decline of socialism. This all happened while we added 2 billion more people to the world. Far more people, far less poverty, better health outcomes, fewer babies dying. That's what economic freedom, capitalism, can do. President John Kennedy, a Democrat, said it best. 
While making his case for significant tax cuts in 1963, he said a rising tide lifts all boats. Kennedy didn't believe that the poor only get richer when the rich get poorer. He believed everyone could get richer with economic growth. History has shown that he was right. This whole capitalism versus socialism debate is backwards. It's not those who advocate for free market capitalism who need to justify their actions. Rather, it's those advocating for socialism or any form of it who have a lot of explaining to do. I'm Andy Puzder for Prager University. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. The top 1% of people on the planet have half the wealth. Western corporations are plundering developing countries. Capitalism is on its last legs. Really? The truth is that global inequality is tumbling. Yeah, the rich are getting richer, but the poor are getting richer faster. And what's driving that process? The market. Look at the most basic measures. Literacy, longevity, infant mortality, calorie intake, height. More and more people are being lifted out of poverty. I think of the changes just in my lifetime. When I was born in 1971, an American worker had to earn a month's salary to be able to afford a TV set. Now it's two days. In 1971, fewer than half of girls worldwide completed at least primary education. Now it's more than 90%. In 1971, a stationary car emitted more pollution than a car moving at full speed today. Go a little further back. In the 17th century, the most powerful man in the world was Louis XIV of France. Every night, he'd have 40 dishes prepared for his dinner, and he'd pick the one that he felt like. But think about it. A receptionist today can stop off at a store on her way home and have not only a wider choice than that king, but a fresher one and a healthier one. We all live better than Louis XIV. And what's caused that miracle? Not any UN development program, not any government aid scheme. What caused it was the market. The most rapid falls in poverty are happening in countries that are joining the global trading system. Compare growth rates in free trade in Colombia and protectionist Venezuela, or in free trade in Vietnam and protectionist Laos, or in free trade in Bangladesh and protectionist Pakistan. It's the same story every time. China after 1979, India after 1991. You remove barriers to trade, prices fall, your people no longer have to work every hour just to afford food and basic commodities. They have time to invent and make and buy and sell other things. The whole economy is stimulated, poverty falls. Okay, you might say. So maybe capitalism works, maybe people are better off. But isn't there a cost? Doesn't it make us more materialistic? Doesn't it make us greedier? Well, if by greed you mean a desire for material wealth, that's part of the human condition. It's in our DNA. Or if you prefer, it's in our fallen nature. Under any system, socialism, communism, fascism, absolute monarchy, theocracy, people want more stuff. The unique quality of capitalism is that it structures the incentives so that the way to succeed, the way to be greedy if you insist on using that vocabulary, is to offer a service to the people around you. Under every other system, you get on by sucking up to those in power, commissars or kings or dictators. But under a free market system, you get on by offering consumers something they want. As the economist Joseph Schumpeter put it, the achievement of capitalism is not to provide more silk stockings for princesses, but to bring them within the reach of the shop girl. So, why can't we see it? Why do well-intentioned, idealistic young people oppose free trade and market liberalization, thinking that they're standing up for the poorest people on the planet, when in fact they're doing the opposite? A big part of the answer is aesthetic. As the Victorian novelist Anthony Trollope wrote, poverty to be scenic, should be rural. I grew up in Lima, Peru, which in those days was surrounded by shanty towns known as Las Barriadas. Western visitors would come and they'd visit Machu Picchu, and then they'd ask in bewilderment why people migrated from the Andes to the slums. 
Why did they swap the clean air and the mountain scenery for open sewers and traffic fumes? It's a very first world question. No Peruvian ever needed to ask why you'd leave a place with no electricity, no school, no clinic, and no jobs. Those shanty towns, those barriadas, for most of their residents are transitional. They're busy places, humming with enterprise, and the people in them sense that they're on their way up. If we want to help those people, the best thing we can do is let them sell us their stuff. Capitalism has achieved things which earlier ages ascribed to gods and magicians. It's abolishing hunger and disease and want. It's led to an unprecedented enrichment that is the central fact of your life. The fact that you're watching this video is enough to tell me that. Now, let it work its magic in the rest of the world. I'm Daniel Hannan for Prager University. There's been a lot said and a lot written about income inequality, about how unfair it is that a few people are very rich and the rest of us aren't, that the income gap between the wealthy and even the middle class, let alone the poor, is so large. There's only one problem with this complaint. It's wrong. Income inequality is actually a good thing when it's the product of a free market economy. And your own life proves it. An economy is made up of millions of individuals making decisions about their own lives, where and how much they want to work, what they want to buy, and so on. You are one of those individuals. In a country like the United States, you are free to pursue a path in life that you believe best suits your talents. That talent might be teaching, or making music, or banking, or starting a small business, or raising a family. Whatever it is, this freedom helps to make life enjoyable, exciting, and meaningful. But it's also an expression of inequality. This is simply because we're all different. We have different talents, different temperaments, different ambitions. That's okay because, again, in a free society, we can seek out opportunities that play to our personal strengths, that distinguish us from others. If you find what you're really good at and work hard, you might have great success and make a lot of money. If you're an outstanding athlete, I'll buy a ticket to see you play. If you're a savvy investor, I'll give you some of my money to invest. As long as you have the freedom to guide your own destiny, you have a chance to reach your full potential, achieving success however you define it. But if someone, say a government bureaucrat, told you that your ambition had limits, that there was a ceiling above which you could not rise, I doubt you'd be happy about it. You'd feel like you were in a straitjacket. Forced equality means less opportunity to pursue what makes you individually great. But what about the growing gap between the rich, the 1%, and the rest of us, the 99% that one hears so much about? Isn't that a bad thing? Again, the answer is no. Here's why. In a free market economy, people become wealthy, making what the rich enjoy today into something almost everybody can enjoy tomorrow. The rich are the test buyers. Consider the cell phone. Now we all have them, but when Motorola manufactured the first one in 1983, it was the size of a brick, had a half hour of battery life, reception was terrible, and calls were very expensive. It cost $4,000. But if no one had bought that $4,000 brick, there wouldn't be a $40 cell phone today. In the 1960s, a computer cost over a million dollars. Nowadays, thanks to billionaires like Michael Dell, we have incredibly advanced computers that cost us a few hundred dollars. Remember what an out-of-reach luxury flat-screen TVs once were? Only the rich could afford them. Today, your living room is essentially your own private cinema. The free market is about turning scarcity into abundance. What was once available to the few is now available to the many. Wealth and equality is an important corollary to that truth. So, should I resent the people who became wealthy because they have more money than I do? Or should I be grateful for the economic system that allows them to enrich my life and the lives of millions of other people? This feature of the free market, income inequality, can appear terribly unfair. But with a little further investigation, the real picture becomes clear. Income inequality makes what once seemed like impossible luxuries available to almost everyone. It provides the incentive for creative people to gamble on new ideas. It promotes personal freedom 
and rewards hard work, talent, and achievement. In sum, income inequality signals that individual liberty, opportunity, and innovation are all present in a free economy. Pretty good for something that's supposed to be so bad. Two final points. The 1% Club is always open to new members. And you don't have to be in the top 1% to have a very good life. And that, not the existence of the very wealthy, is what matters most. I'm John Tamney, editor of Real Clear Markets for Prager University. Why is socialism so popular? Less than 10 years ago, you couldn't refer to socialism in a positive way and hope to have a career in American politics. Socialism was referred to as the S-word. Now it is affirmed either explicitly or implicitly by just about everyone on the left. And amazingly, given socialism's record of failure, the socialists seem to be gaining ground. Why? What makes socialism so attractive to so many? Socialism, according to its proponents, is more democratic and therefore more moral than capitalism. Leftist filmmaker Michael Moore explains it for us. Democratic socialism means everyone has a seat at the table and everybody gets a slice of the pie. The famed socialist writer Irving Howe wrote something similar in his 1982 autobiography. We believe that the democracy in our political life should also be extended deeply into economic life. The basic idea here is that socialism is vindicated through its roots and popular consent. If a majority of people working through their elected representatives declares something to be a public entitlement, say free college or free health care, then they are justified in extracting resources from those who create wealth to pay for it. As Nathan Robinson argues in his book, Why You Should Be a Socialist, the moral imperative is to place the economy under the control of the people. Sounds good, at least superficially, until you dig a bit below the surface. First, what direct control do the people really have over any government institution? What control do the British people have over the National Health Service? What control do Americans have over the Department of Motor Vehicles or the U.S. Post Office? The answer, of course, is none. Given its practical impossibility, genuine popular control over government institutions is a mirage. Second, what if 51% of Americans vote to confiscate the resources of a single person, say, Bill Gates? Does that make it right? Under an authoritarian socialist government, a single dictator seizes the fruits of your labor. Everyone is against that. Under democratic socialism, a majority does. The end result is the same. You've been robbed. The fundamental problem with democratic socialism, however, is its assumption that in a free market system, the economy is not under the control of the people. This is exactly the opposite of how things work. Let me explain. Each of us are not only citizens, we are also consumers. These are overlapping categories. Every citizen is a consumer, and every consumer is also a citizen. The consumer, like the citizen, is a voter. As citizens, we vote once every two or four years. As consumers, we vote many times a day. The citizen votes with a ballot, which costs them nothing except the inconvenience of going to the polls. The consumer votes with his money, which costs him a lot, all the time and effort he put in to earn that money. Only a fraction of citizens are eligible to vote at the ballot box, but every consumer votes in the marketplace, even felons, even children. Illegal aliens cannot vote for political candidates, but they too vote with their money. Moreover, citizens participate in a system of representative democracy. Their views are filtered through the politicians who represent them. Consumers, by contrast, vote in a system of direct democracy. If you prefer an Audi to a Lexus or the Apple iPhone to the Samsung Galaxy, you don't have to elect some other guy to exercise these preferences. You do it directly yourself by paying for them. Here we see the secret of how those billionaires like Jeff Bezos got so rich. We made them rich. The inequality that socialists complain about is the result of popular mandate. Want fewer billionaires? Stop buying their stuff. Free markets work not through greed or exploitation, but by satisfying our wants. And the most successful entrepreneurs are those who anticipate our wants even before we have them. No one wrote Steve Jobs asking him to make a phone that took pictures, allowed people to text messages, and listen to music. He conceived it and built it 
Before we knew, we couldn't live without it. Market economies involve a level of popular participation and democratic consent that politics can only envy. We don't need to extend democracy from the political to the economic sphere. We already have it. And the moral grounding of free markets, just like that of our political system, is in the will of the people. In the latter case, a will expressed only on election day. In the former case, a will expressed deliberately, emphatically, constantly. We don't need socialism because we already have something more moral and more democratic. It's called capitalism. I'm Dinesh D'Souza for Prager University. Capitalism versus socialism. We can sum up each economic system in one line. Capitalism is based on human greed. Socialism is based on human need, right? No. Wrong. So wrong. It's exactly backwards. And I'll prove it to you. Been on Amazon lately? Each of the thousands of products Amazon offers represents the work of people who believe they have something you want or need. If they're right, they prosper. If they're wrong, they don't. That's how the free market works. It encourages people to improve their lives by satisfying the needs of others. No one starts a business making a thing or providing a service for themselves. They start a business to make things or provide services for others. Now, I speak from personal experience. When I was the CEO of the company that owns Carl's Jr. and Hardy's restaurant chains, we spent millions of dollars every year trying to determine what customers wanted. If our customers didn't like something, we changed it, and fast. Because if we didn't, our competitors would, pun intended, eat us for lunch. The consumer, that's you, has the ultimate power. In effect, you vote with every dollar you spend. In a socialist economy, the government has the ultimate power. It decides what you get from a limited supply it decides should exist. Instead of millions of people making millions of decisions about what they want, a few people, government elites, decide what people should have and how much they should pay for it. Not surprisingly, they always get it wrong. Have you ever noticed that late-stage socialist failures always run out of essential items like toilet paper? Of course, this isn't a problem for those who have the right connections with the right people. Those chosen few get whatever they want. But everyone else is out of luck. Venezuela, once the richest country in South America, is the most recent example of socialism driving a prosperous country into an economic ditch. Now, maybe you think it's an unfair example. I I'm not sure why, but okay. We'll ignore the fact that leftist activists celebrated it as a great socialist success right up until it wasn't. But what about Western European countries? Don't they have socialist economies? People seem pretty happy there. Why can't we have what they have? Free health care, free college, stronger unions. Good question, and the answer may surprise you. There are no socialist countries in Western Europe. Most are just as capitalist as the United States. The only difference, and it's a big one, is that they offer more government benefits than the U.S. does. We can argue about the cost of these benefits and the point at which they reduce individual initiative, thus doing more harm than good. Scandinavians have been debating those questions for years. But only a free market capitalist economy can produce the wealth necessary to sustain all of the supposedly free stuff Europeans enjoy. To get the free stuff, after all, you have to create enough wealth to generate enough tax revenue to pay for everything the government gives away. Without capitalism, you're Venezuela. In a 2015 speech at Harvard, Denmark's prime minister took great pains to make this point. I know that some people in the U.S. associate the Nordic model with socialism. Therefore, I would like to make one thing clear. Denmark is far from a socialist planned economy. Denmark is a market economy. So when you point to Denmark as a paragon of socialism, you're really singing the praises of capitalism. The more capitalism, the less socialism you need. Look at America since 2017. A policy of lower taxes and less government regulation, that's more capitalism, has led to a robust economic expansion, something thought impossible just a few years earlier. 
Unemployment, notably among minority groups typically most at risk for poverty, is at a generational low. Economic expansion gets people off welfare and into work. That's less socialism. None of this requires a degree in economics. Common sense is all you need. That's why it's so frustrating to see young people praising socialism and criticizing capitalism. It's bad enough that they're working against their own interests. Better job prospects, better wages, personal freedom. But they're also working against the interests of the less fortunate. Capitalism leads to economic democracy. Socialism leads to the economic dictatorship of the elite. Always and everywhere. So beware what you ask for. You just might get it. I'm Andy Puzder, the author of The Capitalist Comeback for Prager University. Democratic socialism. It's not the same as socialism socialism because it's democratic, right? Or something, right? People are buying that. People buy that now, right? Apparently. As though adding the word democratic in front of a word changes what it means. Just because we toss something to a vote doesn't change what that something is, nor does it alter whether that something is inherently good or bad. Couple of examples, because I know you'll ask, Hamas was democratically elected as the government in Gaza, despite the fact that the destruction of not only Israel, but the eradication of all Jews is in their official charter. Robert Mugabe, or Bobby Mugabe if you prefer, was democratically elected by a loving majority in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, how's that working out? Venezuela? Well, Hugo Chavez, noted personal favorite and friend of Sean Penn, to whom he constantly pointed as being unfairly characterized as a dictator when in fact he was democratically elected as a socialist. Well, how'd that work out for Venezuela? Well, it's now on the brink of collapse, despite it being one of the most resource-rich nations in the entire world. Basic things like eggs, milk, flour, and toilet paper are either too expensive for the average Venezuelan or simply out of stock. Out of stock, mind you, democratically. I know, some of you will say, well, that's not fair because really we knew all along it technically was a dictatorship. Okay, that's fair. Let's move on to example number two. Denmark? Okay, here's the time where you point to an entirely homogenous population about 1 60th the size of America's and you point to that as the blueprint. Okay, let's go there. This is a place where the middle class can't even afford a car because of the 180% new car tax. And the prime minister was so fed up with Americans pointing to it as a beacon for socialist success that he felt compelled to clarify, I would like to make one thing clear. Denmark is far from a socialist planned economy. Denmark is a market economy. Sweden? I love Sweden. Okay, great bikini team, and thanks to that country, my armor now doubles as a bookcase. Speaking of which, the founder of IKEA, let's be honest, the only really cool export from Sweden, aside from a few good hockey players, left Sweden because of the stifling high tax rate. So, Sweden, good place, not bad people, but a successful model for a viable economy in today's global market? Incorrect. The fact is that over time, the greatest enemy of socialism is reality. The reality that human nature will invariably pull certain people toward individualism and success, and others toward laziness and collectivism. The tension between the makers and the takers always, always leads to socialism's inevitable collapse. But I know that I can give you examples of failed socialist economies until I'm blue in the face, and you won't care. Because at least socialism is inherently more morally altruistic than the evil, greedy, capitalist warmongering seen in the West. Greed? What's more greedy than wanting to take from someone else something that you haven't earned? Unlike capitalism, free enterprise, which can only occur truly through voluntary transaction, socialism can only occur at gunpoint. That's what it comes down to. If you don't pay your taxes, once you get through the IRS and the auditing and the lawyers and the PR stunts, People make you give the government your money, an increasing amount of your money, the more successful you are, or they send in scary men with guns to take you away. Now, so long as the people having their stuff taken away at gunpoint are in the minority, and the majority feels that they'll get to benefit from more said taken stuff, you'll always be able to win that decision through a popular vote and claim the moral high ground through democracy. Putting the word Democratic in front of your socialism doesn't make it any inherently more moral, nor less violent. Did you get that? American wannabe socialists also. Get a job. 
please, like a real job. You'll probably have to shave first. I'm Steven Crowder for Prager University. Now, no one disputes that all economic systems reflect the intrinsic self-concern of human beings. But only capitalism creates a group of people known as entrepreneurs who have no choice but to concern themselves with the needs and desires of others. These others are their customers. Few economists, however, actually study the behavior of these entrepreneurs, the creative leaders of capitalist businesses. If they did, they would discover that entrepreneurs, by the very nature of what they do, must shun greed. First and foremost, responding to others is the very opposite of greed. Second, Greed, in the economic sphere, is normally expressed as the immediate consumption of goods and services. I grab what I can without regard for others. But entrepreneurs must begin by saving, which is defined as foregoing consumption to achieve long-term goals. Often it takes months, sometimes many years, to bring a new product or service to market. Furthermore, entrepreneurs must collaborate with others, building teams to achieve their aims. In designing their goods and services, they must, once again, focus not on their own needs, but on the needs of others. This too is the opposite of greed. So what entrepreneurs do when they seek profit is far more than self-interest. Rather, profit is a measure of how well a company has served others. Under capitalism, a business prospers only if customers voluntarily trade for its output. And it's only by improving its service to others that a business can thrive and grow. If the entrepreneur pursues his own interests first and his customer's interests second, his business will fail. And sooner or later, an altruistic entrepreneur will surpass him. Capitalism at its essence, then, is a competition of giving. Of course, self-interest is involved, but the genius of capitalism, and only capitalism, is that it channels self-interest into altruism. Entrepreneurs can only help themselves by helping others. All those who have started a business and made great sacrifices to do so know the drama of that first day. Does the world want what I have to give? Whether it's an immigrant opening a beauty salon or Steve Jobs selling an Apple computer, success is far from guaranteed. In fact, it's just the opposite. Those courageous souls, the entrepreneurs who are the beating heart of capitalism, who bring us the endless material benefits we enjoy, from ATM machines to life-saving medicines, should be held up for admiration, not torn down. Altruism is the very reason for capitalism's existence and why it remains the hope of civilization. I'm George Gilder for Prager University. You love capitalism. Really, you do. And you can't stand big government. Really, you can't. Don't believe me? Then I'll just have to prove it to you. Do you use an iPhone, Android, MacBook, PC? Read on a Kindle? Watch TV and movies on Netflix? Videos on YouTube? Shop on Amazon, listen to Spotify, search on Google, send money on Venmo, grab a ride with Uber, drive with Waze, book a room with Airbnb. Are you on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat? You probably use many, if not all of these things. And if you're like me, you love them. In today's world, they're practically necessities. Where do you think they came from? from entrepreneurs with great ideas and the freedom to test them in the marketplace. That is what is known as capitalism. Now consider some other things you probably use. Have you been to the DMV? Gone through airport security, mailed a package at the post office, called the IRS customer service line, or called any government office for that matter. What's different? Why is going to the Apple store so fun 
but going to the DMV is so painful because one has nothing to do with government and one is the government. One needs to satisfy its customers to survive and grow. One does it. The purpose of government is not to create products, and we don't expect it to. But if you thought about it for a few moments, you'd realize you don't want the government involved in just about anything private business can do. That's because profit-motivated individuals have to work to please their customers. You, government agencies, don't have to please anyone. Call that IRS service line if you doubt me. Can you imagine if Steve Jobs had to seek government approval for every new design of the iPhone? We'd have been lucky to get to the iPhone 3G. Look at Uber. Just a few years ago, summoning a private driver in a few minutes who would take you where you wanted to go was truly a service available only to the wealthiest people. But now, thanks to capitalism, private rides are an affordable option for ordinary people all over the world. Until Uber came around, if it started to rain in, say, Manhattan, and you wanted to grab a cab, good luck. Too many rain-drenched people and too few cabs. Uber had a better idea. Rain falls, demand for rides spikes. Raise prices to incentivize more Uber drivers to hit the road. Ride in the rain problem solved. Airbnb is another example. Only a few years ago, if you were going on vacation with your friends or family, Hotels were just about your only option, but hotels are expensive and often don't provide all that much in terms of space, amenities, or interesting neighborhoods. If you wanted to, say, find out if individual homeowners were making their homes or apartments available for a few nights, you'd have to scour internet postings. But then Airbnb came along, giving anyone with a computer or smartphone access to over 2 million homes in 190 countries. You can find places with hot tubs and pools, or if you're on a tighter budget, you can rent a room or even just a couch. Government never could have done this. What motivation would it have? How would it even know we wanted services like Uber or Airbnb? We didn't know it until risk-taking entrepreneurs made it possible, thanks to capitalism. And no thanks to government, which more often than not just gets in the way. Why? Because the government's knee-jerk reaction is to regulate and control everything it can regulate and control. Otherwise, what would be the purpose of many government agencies and all those bureaucrats? Cities across the world are putting up barriers to slow down or shut down services like Uber and Airbnb. Rulemaking may be the only area where the government shows creativity. Economic growth has the best chance of happening in the absence of that rulemaking. As economist Adam Thayer explains, the internet, to use just one important example, was able to develop in a regulatory climate that embraced what he calls permissionless innovation. This approach to regulating allows entrepreneurs to meet their customers' needs without first seeking government approval. In sum, almost everything you enjoy using is a product of capitalism. Almost everything you can't stand is a product of big government. So do you love capitalism? Of course you do. You practice it every day. It's time to preach it. I'm Jared Meyer of the Manhattan Institute for Prager University. When you hear the words free enterprise or capitalism or free markets, what's the first thought that comes into your head? For just about everyone, it would have to do with making money. But there's another side to free enterprise that's actually more important. Free enterprise matters not just because of its unparalleled material benefits, but because of its unparalleled moral benefits. Now, this might seem counterintuitive to you, especially if you've been spending a lot of time hanging around college professors. For decades, so many of them have preached that free enterprise is mostly about selfishness and greed. But after the fall of the Soviet Union and communism was repudiated, even the left grudgingly acknowledged the utility of free enterprise, but only as a necessary evil. Sure, they said, free enterprise benefits us materially, but the cost isn't worth it. People become too materialistic, corporations become too powerful, profits are corrupting, and there's just too much material inequality. Is that a fair assessment? No, it isn't, and here's why. Free enterprise is not just materially fulfilling, it's a moral imperative. One big reason is that only free enterprise enables us to become truly happy because it enables us to earn our success. Now, what do I mean by this? Earned success is the satisfaction and happiness that we derive from having dreams and working hard to achieve them. 
This is only possible in a system where rewards are based on earning them rather than having the right connections and where you have to please customers and not politicians. Think about the things in your life that make you happy. It's probably your personal relationships, your family, and maybe your job. In other words, the things that represent hard work and personal virtue and achievement. Sure, we all want nice things, but if they're just given to us and we don't earn them, they don't really make us happy. You've probably thought what you'd do if you won the lottery, right? We've all played that game. Maybe you say you'd buy a big house, a new wardrobe, or take a great trip around the world. Maybe you'd do it all. The truth is, according to studies from researchers at the University of Michigan, you're actually more likely to be less happy after you win than before you bought the ticket. People who win the lottery typically buy a bunch of stuff they don't want, get new friends, some even become alcoholics. This hardly makes for a great Powerball ad campaign, but it's the truth. Why is this? For the same reason that your parents probably always taught you that money doesn't buy happiness. Still, critics on the left tell us that if we only had more equal incomes, we'd be a happier society. That's just not true. Happiness is earned, not given by others. Look at entrepreneurs. People who own their own businesses rate themselves as happier than just about any other job category. And why? What's their secret? It's not as if they're working short hours or making lots of money. Neither of these things are the case. Entrepreneurs earn 20% less than government managers on average. Rather, it's because their businesses allow them to earn their own success. It's this success that makes them happy. And this is really only possible through free enterprise. The government giving us stuff we didn't earn doesn't make us happy, and it's really that simple. Now, this insight is hardly one that I came up with. In fact, no one in my field of social science can claim credit for it. It was America's founding fathers who first put together happiness and earned success. You probably remember that the Declaration of Independence talks about the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Think about those words, pursuit of happiness. Our founders didn't say that you have the right to be happy, only that you have the right to pursue your happiness. And that's what free enterprise does and why it matters. Only free enterprise lets us decide what makes us happy and then go do it. The pursuit of happiness that's at the root of America's moral promise can only happen if we have the opportunity to earn our success. Happiness is not about materialism or government redistribution of wealth. It's about defining our lives and our goals and achieving happiness on our own terms. That's the moral promise of free enterprise. I'm Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute for Prager University. Is our economy a machine, like an automobile, a train, or a power plant? One constantly hears phrases such as, the economy is overheating, or needs to cool off, or could use some stimulus. These aren't harmless metaphors. They epitomize how economists have taught us to see an economy as something that can be manipulated, guided, or driven. And guess who does the driving? The government. The government is supposed to make sure that the economy hums along at an even speed, going neither too fast nor too slow. But the economy is not a machine. It is made up of people, and no one can control what billions of them are going to do. What gets overlooked, underplayed, or simply ignored is the extraordinary churn in the activities of a free market. New businesses open while others close, constantly. In the U.S. during normal times, a half a million or more jobs are created each week, while another half million are cut. Entrepreneurs continually roll out new products and services, most of which flop. But those that succeed can greatly improve our quality of life. What government can and should do is to positively influence the environment in which this hum of activity takes place through sensible taxation, monetary policy, government spending, and regulation. And in almost all instances, the best prescription for economic health is less is more. Catastrophic mistakes by governments can poison the marketplace, as happened during the Great Depression in the 1930s, to a lesser extent in the 1970s, and then again in the panic of 2008-2009. The government's recent mistakes have been compounded by tax increases and an avalanche of anti-growth regulations from Obamacare, the Dodd-Frank Financial Services Bill, and all those Washington regulatory agencies, 
such as the FCC, the EPA, and the National Labor Relations Board. If you want to understand why the American economy has been growing at the anemic pace of 1% to 2% a year, look no further. Again, the idea of an economy that purrs along like a well-oiled machine hurts, not enhances wealth creation, because invariably it leads to growth-retarding government intervention. Which brings us to bubbles. Shouldn't the government, the argument goes, at least try to stop them from happening? Well, it depends. Those caused by misguided government policies like the housing bubble of the mid-2000s? Yes. Those caused by the free market? No. Bubbles have a bad name, but not all of them are created equal. There are healthy ones and unhealthy ones. The good kind develops when a lot of people simultaneously recognize a great opportunity. Computers are an excellent example. During the early 1980s, there was a boom in personal computers, followed by a severe shakeout, when companies such as Atari and Commodore bit the dust. In the late 1990s, a number of companies recognized the importance of search engines. Google emerged supreme, with Microsoft and others relegated to fractional market shares. More recently, mobile phones went through its own shakeout, with a dozen different brands competing for market share. Once, Nokia was king, but now the Apple iPhone and Samsung dominate. Good bubbles are a sign of a vibrant and innovative economy. The excesses are ultimately squeezed out and capital is redeployed to more promising opportunities. But bubbles artificially created by government policies, such as the housing bubble, are disastrous. The housing crisis was largely created by government policies, including pushing banks into giving mortgages to people who could not really afford them. When large numbers of those borrowers stopped making their payments, the market crashed and everyone got hurt by unnecessary government meddling. Finally, there are business cycles. Shouldn't the government smooth those out? Economists have puzzled over business cycles, the ups and downs of an economy, for more than 200 years. Most have treated the phenomenon like an illness, something to be cured, instead of what it is. The ebb and flow of the free market, where what people might want is created, and what people don't want is destroyed. Trying to arrest this free market process of creative destruction, as it is known, inevitably leads to stagnation. That is, little or no economic growth. For current examples, see Japan and most of Europe. Here's a rule. The more a government tightens its grip, the less an economy grows. That's because an economy is not a machine and government can't force it to act like one. So let's free the free market. That is and always has been the surest path to prosperity. I'm Steve Forbes for Prager University. Many American millennials seem to be drawn to socialism. They came out in big numbers for Bernie Sanders in the 2016 presidential primaries. They rail against capitalism on their college campuses. They wear Che Guevara t-shirts to signal their socialist virtue. I know a lot about socialism. I live in Rio de Janeiro, and I work throughout Brazil as a journalist for a popular magazine. In the early 2000s, Brazil's economy was growing rapidly. The government had enacted economic and monetary reforms and divested holdings in some state-run companies, giving the private sector more room to breathe. Inflation, a chronic problem in Brazil, was dramatically reduced. Foreign investors poured into the country, eager to catch a portion of our expanding economy. The future seemed promising. But today, our economy is in shambles, unemployment and debt are massive, and powerful politicians are being investigated for involvement in the largest scandals of fraud and corruption in the country's history. What happened? In 2002, a socialist politician named Lula da Silva ran for the presidency. He was a socialist, but painted himself as a modern, cool kind of socialist. He would be the politician who would heal national divisions and unite everyone. He even had a nickname, Lulinha Paz e Amor, which means Little Lula Peace and Love in Portuguese. But the old message about the need for income redistribution to decrease inequality was still there. The media, academic elite and celebrities assured Brazilian that by transferring the money from the rich to the poor, the poor could finally be richer. But the only ones who really got rich were Lula and his corporate and political friends. 
it only got worse under his successor, Dilma Rousseff. The socialists increased government spending, deficits, and debt. They called it a stimulus. They increased the minimum wage and the benefits of social programs. They call it social justice. They increased the salaries and retirement benefits of the civil service. They called it investing in the future. They handed out thousands of jobs in the government and state-owned companies as favors to their political allies. And they called it good governance. It worked for a while. Socialism always works at the beginning. But government spending just kept going up and then Lula's socialist paradise fell apart and the economy fell with it. The outcome? From 2008 to 2015, government spending grew nearly four times as fast as tax revenue. The economy shrank 3.8% in 2015, the worst result in 25 years. That same year, a World Bank survey found Brazil's economy to be one of the world's worst. Out of 189 countries, we were the 16th hardest place to open a business, the 60th most difficult nation in which to register property, and the 12th most complex place to pay taxes. Economically and morally, the almost 15 years of socialist policies have greatly harmed Brazil. We also remain among the world's leaders in murder and robbery, and we rank near the bottom of industrialized nations in terms of education and healthcare. Americans take it for granted that they can be born into the lower class and reach the middle or even upper class. Many Brazilians take it for granted that they can't. But finally, some things are starting to change. There may be reason for hope. Today, more and more Brazilians see that capitalism and limited government are the only way forward. Thankfully for Brazil, Lula has been charged in several lawsuits for corruption, involvement in a criminal organization, influence peddling, money laundering, and obstruction of justice. Rousseff was impeached in 2016 for falsifying the government's finances and illegally using money from state-owned banks to run the government. This crisis prompted the new government to freeze federal spending, reduce the government's role in state-owned companies, and to encourage some of the massive federal workforce to resign. No one knows whether these basic measures will be enough to rescue Brazil economically. Truthfully, the damage has been so extensive it may take decades for the country to recover. But if we do, it won't be socialism that saves us. American millennials, take note. I am Felipe Moura Brasil for Prager University.